Good afternoon, morning, and evening, wherever you are. Thank you for joining us here today for Data Byte number 139, Election Land Misinformation, featuring Ryan McCarthy from ProPublica. My name is Cristina Lopez, Senior Research Analyst on the Disinformation Action Lab here at Data Society. I will be your host, supported, supported by my team behind the curtain, CJ, Rigo, Angie, and Eli. For those of you who don't know us yet, Data Society is an independent research institute studying the social implications of data and automation. We produce original research and convene multidisciplinary thinkers to challenge the power and purpose of technology in society. You can learn more about us through our website at datasociety.net. To begin, I ask you to join me in acknowledging where Data and Society was founded. Lena Pihoking, a network of rivers and islands in the Atlantic Northeast, we now refer to as New York City. Personally, I was born in the lands of Cuscatlan, but I'm based in Nakotstank, now known as Washington, DC. Today, we're connected on the internet, a vast array of servers and devices worldwide. This system sits on stolen land, acquired under the logic of white settler expansion. As an organization, we uplift the sovereignty of indigenous people and commit to dismantling the ongoing practices of colonialism and all its material implication on our digital worlds. And now a little more about, what, about why we're hosting this conversation and about our speaker today. I've been thinking about the harms uh, brought on by online disinformation for a few years now. And I actually came into this field of research during my previous job at a progressive media watchdog where I was deputy director for extremism research. And at the time, the discussion was mostly centered around grappling with the ways that social media platforms and their amplification powers were being used for extremists to organize and for the dissemination of, of harmful disinformation. I joined it in society about a year ago, and I've been working with the Disinformation Action Lab. And our team has been looking not just at this and misinformation, but also lately, and this is something that I'd love to bring into this discussion later, at thinking about the limits of the way that disinformation is defined and the constraints that these definitions introduce and the questions these constraints raise for enforcement. For the past year, our main focus at the Disinformation Action Lab has been in building capacity for a coalition of civil society organizations, providing them with research-based tools to respond to online disinformation, specifically disinformation as it related to the 2020 census. Through this work, we've focused not only on effective ways to reduce the amplification of mis- and disinformation, but also on harm reduction considering first who would be harmed most by the effects of potential disinformation. In the case of the census, it was helpful to consider issues beyond the true and false binary and complicate the analysis to include questions about whose participation would be suppressed the most, which communities are harmed more by undercounts. We then consider strategies to help inoculate these communities against potential harmful narratives. Now I want to turn it over to Ryan McCarty. ProPublica's Election Land Project Editor and Reporter, who covers voting, election security, and misinformation. Previously, he was the Editor-in-Chief of Vice News, where he ran its digital newsroom, built its audio team, and helped launch Vice News Tonight on HBO. He has also held editing and leadership positions at the New York Times, the Washington Post, and Reuters. After Brian's introduction to the project, I'll kickstart the conversation and connect some of the dots between reporting on this information and researching it before inviting some questions from you, the audience. Please add and upvote questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Ryan, give us a scoop on what ProPublica's Election Land Project is all about and some of your key findings. Yeah, so first off, thanks for having me. Um, really glad to be here. Um, it is rare to find the space and time to have these types of conversation during this election season. Um, and I, I'm sure to some degree, we're all a little bit tired of this election, but I'm really happy to discuss this, this pretty serious problem in some of our work. Um, I thought I would just start out with a little bit of um, information on my background since I think it actually did inform some of my work here and, and is relevant to this discussion. 
you know, my career as a, as a reporter and editor tracks pretty directly to the social media era. era. Um, I, uh, my first editing job was at a, a local newspaper um, nearly 20 years ago. Um, but, but my editing career really started in earnest um, a, a little bit later in the early days of the Huffington Post. And these were really the, the sort of halcyon days of uh, digital media and the internet where you know, we were breaking some some real news and, and trying to present digital media in a different way. And of course, that led us to depend on sometimes too much on platforms like Facebook and Twitter. Um, and in the early days, that felt like it was solving a problem. It, it felt like it was a way to make media more immediate, um, more voice driven, sometimes more efficient in ways that some of the larger companies kind of couldn't um, keep up with. And that led me to big digital transformations at places like Reuters and, um, you know, Washington Post and the New York Times. I, I was in the New York Times when we, you know, sort of rolled out um, digital metrics for the first time. And um, that was quite an uneasy transition. Um, but, you know, the last eight, nine years of, of digital media and journalism, no matter how you slice it, have been reckoning with, with the force of, forces of digital distribution for good and bad. Um, and so, you know, I've seen careers and companies built on this and, and seeing those also ruin quite quickly. Um, and so, so that led me to, um, to election land in ProPublica, where I thought we really had a chance to, to cover um, not just, uh, you know, the classic beats of election administration and how people go out to vote, which were changing like crazy during, during this pandemic, but also, you know, the ways in which um, there was a, a pretty large and sometimes well-organized misinformation campaign about what voting is. Um, and so that led us to this project um, in mid-July where we decided to examine um, the, the, as much as we could, the roots and sort of extent of misinformation related to the election on Facebook. Um, we did that, you know, not just because of Facebook's history on um, election related issues and not just because of the president's, you know, continued and false assaults on voting by mail and claims, um, even for elections that he won, um, claims that they were rigged. Um, we, we did that because we knew that election officials and voters um, across the nation were really struggling to figure out what the facts were about um, a very new and very unprecedented election. In a lot of ways, you know, the way America's vote voted has changed more in the last year than it has in the last 10 or 20 at least. Um, so we set out in working with First Draft, which is a, a great, um, you know, social media and misinformation research organization to really just see if we could dig into the landscape of, of what misinformation related to how America votes looked like on Facebook. And um, the findings that we came up with were unfortunately not that comforting. Um, let me just pull some of them up here. I mean, the, the first big finding is that election related misinformation and, and we're defining misinformation as false or, mis, or seriously misleading claims about um, your vote counting, about the ways in which you can vote, about the outcomes of election. And, and we also included in here you know, broad conspiracy, unfounded conspiracy theories about stolen elections. We found that nearly half of the top 50 posts as judged by engagement on Facebook um, contained serious election related misinformation. Um, and so these things were, you know, examples included um, claims that Democrats were stealing the election, you know, misleading claims about how much fraud exists in the voting system, or, you know, claims that were in, in direct um, violation of Facebook's stated standards on election related misinformation. So misrepresentations about whether your vote would count. In one case, we found a very popular um, conservative commentator literally saying that Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton would burn your ballots in their fireplace. Um, Facebook took those posts down after we, we identified them, but the preponderance of of Facebook stories, um, the most dominant um, strain of any single conversation in, in voting on, on Facebook, at least as judged by engagement metrics, was one that was sort of seriously filled with misinformation. And the second thing we found was that election officials are really fighting a constant battle and have been even before 2016 against election-related misinformation on a local level. Um, so, you know, uh, 
the California Secretary of State started an entire you know, office and wing to deal with this. A lot of election, relate, election officials on the state and county level have a direct line into Facebook and Twitter. And they say that the platforms just are more responsive than they were in 2016, but that they still need to proactively put out information to combat election related misinformation. And some of that stuff is, hey, I went to vote and I was denied, there must be a conspiracy. And some of that is largely conservative networks um, of, of commentators pushing out unfounded claims about voting. They, they frankly, in order to do their job, which is literally to facilitate voting and grow voting, they have to fight these battles. And they found that platforms like Facebook are really not always um, willing partners. The, the third thing that we found, um, which is interesting, particularly in, in light of Facebook's recent actions, is that there's a relatively small amount of misinformation in election related ads, paid political ads. Um, we took a, a pretty heavy look at Facebook's ad archive to try to see if you know the kind of claims that you saw in, our, in organic posts claims of stolen elections, conspiracy theories, burned ballots, you know, claims of the next civil war coming from, um, from voting by mail to see if they were really out there and if people were putting some serious money behind them. And the truth is we only found a smattering of paid political ads that contained misinformation. And Facebook has been, including recently, has been pretty upfront that it will limit election related ads um, after the election um, in, in, in an attempt to avoid the problem of 2016. But our research says the problem of 2020 is not in any way similar to the problem of 2016. This is an organic content problem. Um, you know, the fourth thing I already hit on, a lot of the misinformation was not just about your polling place will not open because Democrats will push a, you know, an all vote by mail, um, you know, platform, which was never true. Uh, a lot of it was, um, you know, wild conspiracy claims, and in some cases, racialized claims um, and racialized memes that turn people of color into the face of voter fraud. Um, you know, in, in Facebook's very narrow definition of what voter suppression is and um, what hate speech is, these were not deemed to be violative content, um, which, uh, you know, certainly was not something that civil rights groups um, and a lot of activist groups found um, comforting. Um, but it was very, we found it was very easy to push these types of claims. And um, those types of groups found really were really convenient scapegoats and, and, and really unfair scapegoats for these problems. And, and the last thing I'll say, um, you know, in addition to Facebook's real, relatively narrow definition of voter suppression, they really largely, um, are largely look at um, things that are saying actually don't go out and vote or material misrepresentations about when and how you can vote. Those are, the language is broad, but they're actually applied pretty narrowly. And if you press Facebook on, on, on what voter suppression means, you'll find that their definition is wildly different than activist groups, um, including civil rights groups, how they define voter suppression. Um, the last thing I'll say is that, um, you know, a minor finding that we've had, which is, you know, proven to be true from, from Facebook's history is that by the time they act to stop some of this stuff, to either take it down or slow the spread of misinformation on, on the election, um, it's often too late. You know, so we found one claim from a, a purported Trump voter saying that her vote was denied. It, it turns out it was completely made up. Um, it, the state that it, it referenced was not even holding voting that day. Um, Facebook and its fact-checking partner PolitiFact checked that that piece of content, but by the time a fact-checking label labeling it false um, was applied, it had more than the video had more than 3.7 million views and was shared more than 170,000 times. Um, and that's just sort of what we know of from CrowdTangle, which is Facebook's public analytics tool. Um, so I think I think I'll leave it there. You know, our our, our work really was based in a, a, a midsummer's view on what Facebook was doing about election related misinformation. They've taken a number of actions since which we can sort of talk about. But I think the, the worrying thing is that the problem is seems central and sort of endemic. And, you know, we, the caveat on this research is, of course, we have a very limited set of data. Data, data on what Facebook, um, what the world of Facebook is. And it's largely through CrowdTangle. Um, the most engaging Facebook, which is a, you know, a 
a metric determined by a, a sum of shares, likes, and reactions um, tells us that Facebook has a serious um, uh, problem with election-related misinformation that has, in fact, I think, poisoned the well on its um, on its on its ability to get reliable election-related information out there. And I think one telling thing is after we we wrote the story. They did announce and have announced a series of, of linking and labeling policies where they actually push people away from Facebook into state or local um, voting sites um, to try to get them information on that. And I think we can debate whether or not that's sufficient. I think it's, it's good to see that they're doing that. But I, just, I do think it is a, in part a mission of the problem that they're actually saying Facebook users step away if you want to find real information about voting. So I'll, I'll leave it there if that's good. Thank you so much. I think that's amazing table setting for, for conversation. I actually want to start our discussion with specifically with, with social media platforms and the related issues of, of responsibility and accountability, because we've often heard leadership at platforms whenever their feet are on fire say that they don't want to be in the position of editors or that they don't want to be in the position of being the arbitrators of, of what's true and what's false. And, and they say that their responsibility really stops at just facilitating um, the right of, uh, to free speech of other people. And so when you actually consider the harms of disinformation that come from the amplification and reach and how much of that is actually facilitated by platforms, we actually land back on the question of accountability. And, and oftentimes, you know, like excellent reporting, excellent election reporting exists, but but it really cannot compete in terms of speed and reach with, with just the way that election disinformation travels. So I think I want um, us to talk a little bit about the responsibility of platforms in this scenario and, and maybe um, talk a little bit about what changes they did uh, based on after your reporting. Maybe um, that could shed some light on the ways that maybe we can hold them accountable. Yeah, so I think it's good. I'll, I'll just start with what's happened since July when we dropped this article. Um, you know, on the day we, we we published it, they did announce a broader linking policy, essentially linking to you know um, nonpartisan um, voting related sites underneath po politicians posts. Since then, they've sort of taken a, a number of sort of escalatory actions that are similar to that. Um, you know, they've banned militarized language in um, talking about poll watching. You saw the president's son um, call for an army of poll watchers. Um, and, and they they were late to that. And, and those messages were certainly circulated wi widely before they did that. You know, they have um, banned election ads after um, the election. They have announced policies to put what are, what are quote, non-neutral labels, um, pushing back on things that are actually untrue. Um, but in other cases, they, they, they've yet to take serious action. I mean, it, the, the post that President Trump put up saying, you know, imploring people in North Carolina to go vote twice, um, you know, I, I think their reaction to that was not what election officials would want. And it, you know, it certainly traveled a lot farther than, say, the North Carolina Attorney General's warning saying that voting twice is illegal. Um, so I want to go back to the responsibility issue, though, because I think, and the accountability issue, I think this is actually pretty important. Um, the, the idea that um, social media companies are just a mirror to society and just a reflection of their users' interests, I think, is one of the original lies about social media. Um, you know, I think we need to make sure that we understand as users that the people who build these products are making affirmative choices, um, and those affirmative choices affect what you see. And we can quibble about whether or not Facebook is a, is a media company or some weird new, uh, you know, platform slash publisher. Um, but, but the truth is they, the impact they have is similar to that of a publisher. And so I think like they are making choices that will incentivize certain kind of actions and penalize others. Um, so I think that that is sort of the first ground rule we have to think about when we, um, when we, when we think about Facebook and, and Twitter and, and YouTube and stuff like that. The second thing is, and, and, I am not the first one to say this, um, but I think another one of the sort of the original uh, misconceptions about social media is um, that these are our social media platforms first. 
Um, Facebook, in any case, is you know earns ninety five percent of its revenue from advertising. This is an advertising business, you know, and I think we don't look at Exxon and call it a, a people moving business, you know. Um, so I, I I do think like there is a bit of marketing spin when you imbue an advertising platform that lets you have free social media features with democratic qualities or qualities that we should normally invest in you know, civic institutions or in um, other things that, that sort of contribute to democratic society. So I think like holding these, these um, platforms accountable as businesses, advertising businesses first, and ones that are making choices that, that we know um, can affect the way people see the world and can affect um, democratic institutions and sometimes undermine them, I think is key to, to keeping them actually accountable. Because if, if we let, um, you know, platforms sort of see themselves as, as central and inseparable from democracy, I think they've won. I think that's a really, really good point. And a lot of, a lot of people have, have been into the narrative that they are not really editors or that they're, they're neutral to whatever happens and reflect what's going on. And I think that largely due to like how much of 2016 and how the story that came out of that election was centered on this information, they came out this year, I, in some, a year in advance, specifically Facebook in October of 2019, and they built ahead of this election, a number of election integrity policies. And they were, you know, looking at what you can call the, the low hanging fruit, right? The, those that were seeking to reduce an authentic behavior, they, they were very narrowly, but at least focusing on voter suppression. But I kind of want to lead the conversation here towards the limits of the disinformation definition, because as we understand it is, you know, information that is false, that has the potential to harm and that is spread with ill intent. However, and like specifically in the context of the election, you might have seen that the information that we're seeing amplified, it goes beyond necessarily just the true or false net binary. You see entire narratives, entire storylines that, that some are playing up true elements, but that have been completely decontextualized in, in efforts to manufacture doubt, like weaponizing electoral reporting, but in order to hurt the perception of legitimacy in the electoral process. Like in different words, the, the biggest issue often is the framing and bad faith that occurs. And, and I'm thinking about, you know, the rampant speculation that you mentioned in your intro about potential voter fraud via absentee ballots or, or accusations that a lot of practices that are they're actually legal in a lot of states and, and that have nothing nefarious about them, like, like ballot harvesting, how those are equated sometimes in, in memes and content as equivalent to, to ballot box stopping. So I kind of want to expand a little bit on, on something that um, I think would be really interesting to consider, like from your position as a journalist covering the election, how do you grapple with the risk of having your story being amplified for nefarious purposes or, or decontextualized to advanced narratives that, that you actually have very little power to combat and that seen with the very narrow scope of what the platforms are considering to be election integrity policies would likely go under the radar. I think that's a, such a really good point, um, you know, both about the idea that there is not a lot of the problematic content is not just like binary true or false, but blends some serious false elements with some stuff that's like actually pretty, pretty true. Um, in, in that the idea that, you know, as a reporter, even if you're the most straight down the line person in the world, your, your information will be weaponized. On that last part, you know, last week um, in partnership with the Philadelphia Inquirer, um, I wrote a story um, about um, local election offices being inundated with duplicate mail-in ballot applications, um, largely because, you um, Pennsylvania is growing its vote by mail operation in an unprecedented fashion. Voting groups are sending out unsolicited ballot applications to people not knowing whether or not they've received one prior. And, and in some cases, the state websites are inaccurate or totally misleading and causing people to just request more ballot applications. And so this is not a story which says our you know, election is doomed or that voter fraud is rampant. This is a story about administrative failure 
and um, or administrative struggles, right? Because Pennsylvania's election, I just want to be clear, has not failed. Um, but you know, election offices were spending, you know, in some cases working 24/7 processing duplicate applications. 90% of the some of the applications that they were processing were duplicates, which is just a silly a silly sort of administrative uh, struggle. Um, but it, as soon as we put that out, um, the our story got twisted by conservative commentators who. Um, instead of uh, nearly 400,000 mail-in ballot applications being rejected by Pennsylvania, they took the applications out. Um, and so the difference here is when, you're, when you want to vote by mail, you usually have to fill out some forms proving to your state or county that you're eligible to do it. But usually it's a, it's a rubber stamp, um, especially for, for states with no excuse voting. Um, but conservative commenters removed that applications part of it, I think intentionally, to try to cast doubt on voting by mail. And those things, they largely weren't fact-checked because I think the fact-checking um, operations for the platforms just, just don't have the, the manpower to keep up with everything. And they circulated widely, um, thousands and thousands of retweets. Um, and there's, there's sort of nothing really you, you can do about that. Um, but I, I, I do think the problem where you have a claim that circulates widely online, one that says all vote by mail is fraud, and then mentions one legitimate, though infinitesimally small incident, incident of, of vote in fraud, of mail in fraud, um, is, is a problem of sort of proportion and framing and contextualization that the platforms really, really struggle with. And I, I think that the only way to, to sort of solve that is to try to take a look at um, either a, do a network analysis as, as other people have suggested, or, or look at some of the dominant narratives, look at the meta narratives that run through multiple conversations and multiple commentators to try to say, is there a way that we can turn down the volume or disincentivize stuff that has a significant misleading element to it? Um, and, and I think that that takes the conversation beyond individual takedowns and more, you know, looking at the health of, of social media systems as a whole. Right, that's a really good point. Maybe turning it into an analysis of who is harmed the most by this, who would find it really, really hard to vote if presented with, you know, what is likely to get the most engagements. And I, I actually want to focus a little bit on that on the harm question, because you know, a huge casualty of the increasingly fragmented media landscape and of the business model dependence on platforms for traffic has been uh, local media, really. Local newspapers have disappeared at alarming rates. There are areas that are actually news deserts now and they're all over the country. And, and I, I read somewhere that, that you can say that the local reporting, well, is drying while we deal with a deluge of disinformation that is created at the national level and that has huge funding and that is often attempting to pass as local information as, as we've seen in, in recent re reporting. And I wanted to bring this up because I, I really want us to focus a little bit on, on the harms. And, and kind of move away from the abstraction that it is truth or, or reality that is harmed by political disinformation. Because I think it's important that we, that we, we learn from this and you know, leaning into your reporting and your knowledge of this beat, we should focus a little bit on the victims. Can you talk a little bit about who is harmed at the local level? Maybe let's, let's discuss a little bit those, those lo local election officials and, and those voters with a, without enough quality information that might it, find it really, really hard or might be terrified to go vote. Yeah, I mean, it just to zoom out on the problem with this, the stat that flies around a lot from some of the media analysts over the last 12 to 15 years is that newspaper employment has fallen faster than employment in coal, um, in American coal mining, which, which is just, a, a really sad state of affairs for the ability of, of sort of local communities to get reliable and factual information about the basic functions of governance. And, you know, prime of, of those concerns is really election related concerns, especially in a year where, you know, some states are growing their share of, of vote by mail ballots from 4% to close to 50 overnight. Um, there's it's really crucial that people sort of trust the information coming out from their local community. And the truth is there, there really 
isn't another outlet for that other than newspapers right now. I think there was a thought that social media companies would, would lead to new business models that could fill the local reporting gap. If that's going to happen, and I'm dubious that it will, it hasn't happened yet. Um, so when you talk to local election officials um, about the problem of misinformation, about the problem of saying, look, I have to spend millions buying PPE and printing mail-in ballots, and I don't want those to be wasted. Um, and, and those folks will, will, will say this to you, regardless of what side of the aisle they're on. And the, the local news, um, to the extent that it hits their community, gets swept up in these national mega narratives. So, you know, in Patterson, New Jersey, there was a case of election fraud where some local candidates for office there um, seemed to engage in some, in some ballot harvesting. Ballot harvesting is legal to a point. You can collect other people's ballots in New Jersey as long as you're not doing it for more than three people and as long as you're not an unauthorized, um, you know, sort of transporter of those. But it, it seems like there was some illegal behavior in here on a limited and local level. Um, but of course, there just really aren't enough local news resources to really delve into that in depth. And so there, there's really only been surface explorations of, of the problem in Patterson, New Jersey. And that's what happens. Um, folks in who have maybe pre-existing views about voter fraud seized on this and tried to turn it into a national story without the type of scrutiny, detail, context, and nuance that would come if you had sufficient local reporting news, news resources to, to handle it there. And that's happened with a number of cases of election related misinformation. Um, and, and obviously that problem is not related to election related, mis not cons uh, constricted to election related misinformation. And so, you know, a, a lot of times you'll have national news organizations, in some cases like ProPublica, parachuting into local communities to fight this problem. Um, and I, I, I do think that you, we can get tied up in knots about how or whether um, social media companies have destroyed local news. I, I, I don't think that's, a, a, a frankly, a useful discussion at this point. I do think that um, in information deserts or news deserts, the social media companies just have the potential to do so much more harm um, because they're not competing any, against any other local news resources. That's a really, really good point. And maybe because I want to turn it into a little more positive or, or empowering side of the conversation, we've, we've talked a lot about the role that, that platforms have to play and you know how they should definitely have policies against disinformation. Ideally, we'd like to see more consistent enforcement. Ideally, we'd like more transparency so that we know what we don't know and we know whether the measures applied so far are working or if they are just another PR stunt. But one of the things that that I think we don't talk about enough in discussing a problem that is a networked problem like this information is how it still is a networked solution. And there is, you know, everyone has a role to play. And you kind of alluded to this earlier in your introduction when you mentioned the partnership that ProPublica had with, with First Draft. And there is definitely a role for, for scholars, for civil society, for journalists, even journalists that are spread super thin in the election, um, in, in combating this information. And maybe let's, let's talk a little bit about how is the experience of partnering up with, with civil society and, and independent researchers to, to try to tackle this problem? Because I think the case studies like this are incredibly valuable for, for other situations of disinformation. Absolutely. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what ProPublica has done and, and will, is doing in the future, and then um, you know, try to get at, get at what's sort of left on the table, um, at least from my view. Um, so ProPublica runs a, a project called Electionland, which um, is now in its third election, I believe, um, started in 2016, in which um, local newsrooms can partner with us and we get tips from a massive um, group of uh, civic society organizations, election protection organizations, and we feed those tips out after checking them. We feed those out to local newsrooms and, and they report on voting problems in, in something like real time around the election. This year we've expanded election land a little bit with some grants that we've offered to local newsrooms to do investigative, more long lead 
um, stories about um, elections. Um, we partnered with the Tampa Bay Times this year, um, the Philadelphia Inquirer, Georgia Public Broadcasting, and an organization called Wisconsin Watch to do that. Um, and, you know, in, in investigating this election story, um, we worked with First Draft, which was a, a really fruitful partnership. Um, and they have access to data that, that frankly would just take us a lot longer to look at. Um, but I think in terms of like what's sort of left out there in solving a network problem, and I think it's a really important point that, again, is not about individual takedowns or individual bad actors. This is about a networked and, and sort of incentive-based problem. I think like we need to, if, if this is a network problem, we need to know what the network is, right? So like, we need to not just know some basic information about engagement. We need to know about what kind of posts are actually leading to takedowns. Facebook is not transparent about its takedowns. It, it brags about some, it does others in the, on the cover of night. Um, we need to know about the ways in which um, different actors share or coordinate, um, which in some cases is counter to Facebook's rules about coordinated and authentic behavior. We know that memes can sp um, spread really quickly. And we don't know how that spread actually works because Facebook won't let us see any of that data. Twitter won't either. Um, you know, one, one idea there is to try to look at, are there um, websites that are sharing or, or are there Facebook pages or Twitter pages that are sharing the same content, the identical content with um, absolutely no alterations within the span of a minute or something like that. That I think would, would let us get a little bit clearer about what problems we're actually trying to solve here. Because I, I think you can hire an infinite number of content moderators to solve some of this. And frankly, I think Facebook and other platforms should hire more to live up to their actual promises. But I think until you know the sometimes inauthentic and sometimes just odd ways in which information groups together through networks and flows, um, and, and until you know the, the full influence of that, I don't think you can really solve this problem. So I, I think if, if platforms like Facebook were serious about this problem, I think they would open up to that idea that um, you know this is not a, a, a serial problem. This is a problem where you need to change sort of the the, the incentives and the the real flood of of, of information um, and and how that's propelled through networks. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point. And we learned very similar lessons through our work in partnering with civil rights organizations in terms of combating something that had, I would say, not even close to the volume that we saw with election disinformation, but disinformation that was targeting the 2020 census. In some ways, there's there's a lot that you can do in terms of like petitioning to social media platforms and suggesting what you think could be you know, best practices in terms of how you want to see those civic integrity policies enforced. But at, at the end of the day, you don't have the capacity to figure out where the, the coordinated behavior is coming from or who is even reaching when you lack so much transparency in terms of what happens under the hood uh, at social media platforms. One thing that we found was, at least within the realm of what, what, what you can do um, from civil rights or civil society organization side, was to think of audiences as not necessarily a general way, but to think of their audience and to try to flip the analysis into who would be harmed the most by you know, this narrative in the wild or this potential strand of disinformation and to, and to prepare and caring for your audience, for your little group online and trying to figure out where this little group gets their news and trying to protect that because the trying to combat it from the other side, it, it does seem like a game of walk and roll really, really quick, really, really quickly. Um, let's well, turn out. That, yeah, go ahead. One thing on that before we move on, which I, I just wanted to mention, um, you know, I think like a lot of the political science research um, and just the, the academic research says that any barriers that you put up to, to someone voting or getting information about voting can actually turn them off and, and decrease the likelihood that they vote. So, so I think like oper platforms operating from that perspective would be really useful. And I'm not sure they're operating from that perspective. The second thing is, um, you know, I think like there 
platforms should care about the overall kind of institutional creep and in, in like, um, I would say it's sort of belief in the system long term. And this is a, something that political scientists worry about with election related misinformation, even if some of it is like borderline factual and not worthy of a, of a direct immediate takedown, stuff that proliferates on, on platforms and, and constantly fights against like the reliability of our electoral systems or the reliability of our civil institutions, that may not have an acute immediate damage to people's ability to turn out. But over the long term, that's going to degrade our belief in society. And I just, I, I think that is a, a, a slow creep problem that platforms really should be incentivized to fix. And I'm not sure they're even thinking about it, to be honest. We thought about it in the same way it, with regards to the 2020 census. We, when we think about things in just like the tight binary of this is true or this is false. And that that does leave out the slow drip i would say that has lasting impacts that we can't really measure right now and and that is people's perception of legitimacy in the system in institutionality and in the, in the core values that make a, a democracy work and i i agree with you i don't know that that it's being thought about in that from that angle within social media companies and even in some newsrooms, I don't think. So I think that's totally right about newsrooms as well. Um, yeah, it, it that long term problem, it would be great to get some thinking going on that about our information systems, because like, man, I worry about that all the time. And I have no idea what I can do to, to affect change on that. Let's turn into some of the questions that have been left on the Q&A. One of them is says that they understand the need for social media companies to be accountable to stop the spread of election disinformation. But I am also worried about the possibility of allowing social media companies to wield too much power over the content shared on their platforms. For example, if social media was popular in the early 2000s, what would have stopped these companies from censoring skepticism about the existence of WMDs during the Iraq war. I do think about this a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, look, I think it, it's interesting. If you look at some of the ads that um, companies like Facebook, well, Facebook in particular actually, runs on places like Axios or you know, media sites, they, they actually are pretty open that they welcome internet regulation. And certainly they're spending money to, to, to lobby on it. But I, I think this is this is where we need to realize that like Facebook has what over 2.7 billion users. In some in some extent, as I said, it is it is not a mirror to society. But in some extent, if we don't put our own values on top of it, there Facebook will insert its own values in there. And so I I, I do think we should be worried about mass censorship. I just don't think that's the problem right now. Um, and we need to plan for that possibly becoming a problem. But I think reliable information, um, you know, the preponderance or the relative lack of reliable information on, on platforms is, is a more urgent problem to uh, what's going on right now. But I, I also look, Facebook is, is, is so vast that it's hard to generalize. I think in America, <laughs> The problem, um, you know, is about reliable information. In 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 other places, you know, state-sponsored, uh, inauthentic media campaigns may be a bigger issue. Hate speech may be a bigger issue. And you know, we we do. I know Facebook leadership tends to take a very Western-centric uh, look at the the biggest problems and, and tends to underinvest in problems in the rest of rest of you know the the world out there. Um, so I, I don't know if that, that answers the question, but I, I, I do think like they are both serious problems, but at least in America right now, the acute problem is misinformation in my view. I also think that the fear of the, the censorship um, issue is often what allows a lot of social media companies to kind of let themselves off the hook. You brought up something that is very, very near to my heart because I am, I am from El Salvador where social media companies are used by the state often 
to have amazing reach on with without any competition and and honestly it is the fear of censorship what keeps social media companies from actually intervening or dismantling entire operations of of what is inauthentic behavior and that are being used to to su suppress actual journalism so it is an issue that that is worth paying attention to without letting social media companies use that narrative to their advantages. We have another question. It seems like many journalists view their job as essentially exposing problems and points of failure. But as you mentioned, this kind of reporting can easily be weaponized to undermine the legitimacy of the election. Would it be useful for journalists to instead think about their work as providing alternative narratives that can combat harmful ones like voter fraud? Or is man votes by mail legally and easily just never going to be a story? <laughs> yeah, I, I think this is a real problem, right? So like I, I go back to like the classic definitions of, of journalism, you know, as expressed by the, the, the people who've been around forever and are, you know, more accomplished than me. You know, uh, seek the truth, first of all, um, hold power to account, second of all, and third, explain the world. And, um, you know, I think depending on how those three qualities are, uh, what percentage you, you dedicate to each of them and what proportion, um, you come out with different answers. I, I think the truth is, like, journalists kind of need to use all of those. Um, and the idea that we should be afraid of reminding folks that our system works is kind of silly and probably reveals the bias towards the new or the salacious or you know stuff that's more accountability focused in, in journalism. I, I think it would be great if the New York Times or ProPublica or something like that ran an article which said, I think there were some problems with the election, but it largely worked. And I hope that they do run that because I don't think you can get around the idea that you have to fight against, um, you know, the growing powers of misinformation and propaganda in society right now. And my guess is that there is a probably a 50-50 chance that the Post or the Journal or the New York Times runs a story which essentially says our election system basically worked. Um, I hope they do. Um, and if, if they don't, we can write some letters. I don't imagine it would go viral, but I mean, <laughs> from the perspective of journalism, you can definitely remind folks that, you know, voting by mail is boring and easy and it works. Um, you mentioned earlier, there's another question, um, that Facebook has a really narrow definition of voter suppression misinformation. How can you, how, how do you talk to organizations or people with similar conceptions of misinformation about expanding or reframing their understanding of the issue? Yeah, I think just going back to what I was saying, I think, um, and this this is not just me saying it, I think the civil rights folks um, who, uh, you know, participated in um, Facebook civil rights audit earlier this year and some of the groups that were leading the boycott, um, they argue that Facebook takes a too narrow definition of voter suppression, stuff that is actually suppressive. And I think this idea of stuff that really calls uh, into, into question the basic legitimacy of, of our electoral system fits into that definition. Facebook thinks that's allowable political speech. And I think on a, on a sort of like black and white principle level, I think they're right. Um, but the problem becomes when that kind of political speech dominates its platform and um, is spread quickly and in some cases in a, in a coordinated fashion and in some cases just really takes over the conversation. Um, so I, I think like when you're talking about people like that, uh, about those, those meta narratives, um, I, I think you really have to remind them of a sense of proportion. Again, going back to the voter fraud issue, um, it is vanishingly rare that voter fraud happens in any form, including in voting by mail. But fraud in voting by mail is is modestly more common um, than it is in in-person election fraud. That said, you are more likely to get struck by lightning than to ever, you know, be uh, a perpetrator of, of vote by mail. And so, I. I I think proportion and context is really important when you're talking about this sort of stuff. But, um, you know, again, to, to hint at something that Christina said, proportion and context don't travel well on social media. <laughs> in fact, stuff that doesn't have that travels, travels faster. <laughs>
I also think there's some value, again, going back to the issue of who is harmed the most. When, if social media platforms kind of took the perspective of, of the harm group more often, rather than the perspective of the group that is likely to backlash and make, you know, mount a social media campaign about censorship when policies get enfor enforced, I do think that a lot of the damage could be curtailed at least. Um, and then we have this, this looks like an easy one, I guess. What public policy solutions would you suggest to stem the flow of electoral misinformation? Super easy. Um, I don't know. I mean, look, I, I think I'm a little bit uncomfortable proposing policy solutions as a journalist. I think the concepts though behind it, I think some of which we've already touched on. Um, first off, I think platforms like Facebook need to live up to their promises, right? If they say they're gonna ban militia related content, you know, uh, profiles with militia in the title should be taken down. <laughs> you know, if they they say they're serious about state sponsored action in other countries, they should, they should get serious about that. And it, there is increasing evidence and continued evidence that they're just not hitting their own goals. And that is not to say that they should catch every problem on their platform. I think the biggest complaint is just like, do more of what you say you're gonna do. But um, in terms of like actual policies, I think we need to know about the health of the network, going back to what we were saying earlier. And, and I think we need some like actual metrics and research done by third parties about how healthy Facebook's discussion on certain topics is with particular mind to, to things like Christina said, like who could be most harmed from this? If I have never voted by mail and if this is my first vote or if um, you know I am in a, <laughs> In a, in a voting group that has faced historical barriers and very direct intentional barriers to voting, how could I be harmed by this kind of information? Um, and, and I think approaching um, it from a regulatory standpoint, like that would be good, but I, I don't think we can do that without seeing more of, of what is actually happening on there. Um, you know, uh, Kevin Roos of the New York Times, which we're all familiar, has this automated bot about the most popular um, popular by engagement platforms, uh, posts on the platform on Facebook in any given day. I think that's good. Um, you know, Facebook has in, at times responded saying that, that engagement isn't reach. Um, in my experience as someone who's helped run digital brands, engagement and reach are highly correlated, um, not perfectly, but highly correlated. That's a basic question we need to know, right? If, if the discussion on Facebook is a lot healthier um, than we're seeing, or if there are other ways to measure this, we, sh we should know that. The evidence, both from the impact that we can tell um, in talking to people and reporting, election officials, voters, is not good. The evidence on um, you know, what we know of engagement metrics is not promising either. I agree with you. I think that in the issue of being platforms, the ones advertising often, and you, know, you mentioned Axios, but platforms are advertising and spending a lot of money in a campaign that basically asks to like be re regulated, come and regulate us then. We welcome regulation, but it is really hard to do when you don't have data that would allow you to figure out which solutions are the ones that would work. We know very little in terms of the solutions that they have enforced themselves so far. We know very little about how successful they are because we don't know whether you know, if presenting voters with neutral information or links to a different neutral nonpartisan site that will tell, you know, show the right way to vote, we don't know the click through rate. And we don't know if folks see those as annoying pop-ups or if they see anything that would divert them away from the platform as a valid or unmeddling way um, to deal with an issue like an election. So. It, it, I, I do believe there is regulation that would ameliorate some of the harms in the problem. I don't know that platforms have been forthcoming enough and presenting enough information to know that the regulations that, that could be available are those that would also be successful and that would also be valuable. Um, we actually are almost at time, so I would like to leave some time um, for you to Tell us if, if there's anything that you'd like to leave with us today, even if it's a wish list or anything that you'd like to see happen in you know the little time we have until the election. Yeah, I mean, I think um, 
there is this cliche called the election administrator's prayer, which is like, whatever happens, don't make it be close. Um, so I know that a lot of voters feel that way and a lot of election officials feel that way. Um, I think there is a there is a good chance that we avoid, a, you know, a misinformation disaster this time around and an election related disaster this time around. I guess my wish list would be that um, both of them involve like big, messy, varied institutions. One is just like a classic civic institution and one that has sort of become one. Um, I hope that we solve the problem like as as related. Right. Because I think we could have the most fully functioning election system in the world. And I would argue that we don't <laughs> just yet. Um, but uh, we could have that and still have these strains of propaganda and misinformation swirling around. And and we wouldn't like trust it or believe in it or rely on it to, you know, yield like fair democratic outcomes. And so so I like I I I think one of the lessons of the social media era, just to put a cap on it, is like the information problem is a civic problem. And um, I just I, I hope that whatever uh, sort of policy discussions um, or regulatory discussions or individual choice discussions happen on the voters or, or users of these platforms keeps that in mind, that there is in our digital spaces, there is a civic duty that we all have and that the platforms we rely on have. And I would also hope that we move a little bit towards more considering not like the perspective of who's harmed and also considering the the implications of the the slow drip what that could be changing in terms of how the the doubt that is being manufactured or just you know planting that seed of doubt how that could affect the perception of a lot of potential new voters who this is perhaps their first election and they might not feel very encouraged in continuing to participate in the system. And you might be just leaving the choice of deciding who represents us to the few people who are not yet cynical about the system, who haven't seen enough memes about the election to get <laughs> that perception of legitimacy eroded. So hopefully I, I, would, I would hope for more conversations to be had in, at, at this level, not just um, within social media platforms, but I know that definitely so, like civil society is having them. I know that scholars have been having them for a while and, and, and at newsrooms, it, it does, it has become a little bit of a new challenge. I, I do hope that these conversations continue outside of, of just the election. And I want to thank everyone for joining us. And thanks again to Ryan McCarthy for sharing your expertise today. And for the time you generously shared with us and preparing for this discussion to be the success I believe it's been. Um, check the chat window for hashtags uh, to keep this conversation going on social media. You know where to find us and, and reach us. Please complete the short free question survey before you leave. And just a reminder that this event's recording and the resources will be posted on Data Society's website soon, that is datasociety.net, datasociety.net, where you can also find our research and programming. So we hope you'll join us again for a future program. Thank you so much and take care.